Welcome to Out of the Blank. Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with Louise. Louise, for everyone out there listening, can you please introduce yourself? Um, so hi, I'm Louise. Uh, Louise O'Hare. I work at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Um, and I'm really interested in um, visual discomfort. So why things look bad. So we're talking about stripes and flashing lights, that sort of thing. And uh, not sort of pictures of snakes or anything. So nothing sort of really low level things. And also more recently, my work's been into migraines. Um, so I'm really interested in why people get headaches, essentially. What do you, why do you think people get headaches? <laughs> that is a very large question. Um, <laughs> one that I don't really have a straightforward answer to. So maybe we should start quite small. So there's quite a few things in um, visual stimuli that the visual brain isn't really very good at looking at essentially so we're adapted to our environment um, and that includes our visual system as well so I probably should tell you you might be wondering why a psychologist is interested in vision at all actually and um, the visual areas of the brain take up about a quarter of it that occipital cortex at the back so the whole chunk at the back of the brain is just devoted to seeing things and that's really quite incredible actually so when we look around you know you don't think anything about seeing everything in sort of really high definition, it's all in color. Um, you don't need to wait for your eyes to refocus the way that your phone camera does. You know, you can adapt to various light levels very instantly, you know, so if you just walk outside and walk into a building, if you notice the difference in light levels, so if you've got those glasses that um, change color with the light, so they turn into sunglasses when you walk outside, it takes a little while for them to adapt. Whereas your eyes and your brain can sort of rewire itself really, really quickly. So it's pretty incredible what we can do. And also we see the world in 3D, which is amazing. Well, most people do, um, which is pretty impressive when you think about the maths involved about trying to recreate it, you know, the 3D movies and things like that. And people don't always quite get it right. Um, but your brain is brilliant at doing that all by itself. So it's pretty impressive what it can do. So what I've been interested in is one when it can't do it anymore. So it takes lots of shortcuts and things like that to be able to do all of this really complicated um, sort of maths <laughs> behind the scenes to help you see things um, and sometimes that goes a little bit wrong so one thing to look at is um, you're mentioning earlier about the 3D cinemas so some people don't like looking at those and that's there's quite a straightforward answer to those so when we look at an object in the world um, we turn our eyes inwards to look at it that's called vergence if you're interested in technical jargon and we also focus on it and normally those two systems are perfectly matched. So there's never an instance in the real world where we're looking at something um, and it's not the place where we think it is, essentially. It just doesn't happen. But in 3D TVs and in the cinema and things like that, uh, people need to sort of break those rules a little bit. So your eyes will be turning in to a point that's at a different place of where the screen is. So your eyes will focus at the screen, but your eyes will turn into a different point. So these, these two things aren't matched up anymore. And that is called an accommodation vergence conflict, if you're <laughs> interested in the technical terminology. Um, but that's really difficult for the brain to get its head around, essentially. So that doesn't normally happen in the real world. And when it does happen in that artificial environment, they think that's what might give people headaches. So that's sort of one reason for it. Another one is, sorry, if you're about to say something. Well, I'll about to say, so would that be just the brain's, not even the brain's processing power, but the brain, I guess the brain's power to adjust to things. Like if you're talking about like visual focus, I mean, if we have like, like, like I was telling you, I went to the movie theaters and I sat front row and you have those giant screens. It's different when I'm sitting at a distance, my brain has a smaller view to be able to perceive information. But then when you expand that view out, it also has to adjust. The next thing you know, you know, 
if you stare at a screen too long, people usually get headaches after a while. You know, that's what makes like virtual reality a problem for some people. Not only the massive amount of stuff that's going on, but it's also you're having a screen basically pressed right up to your eyes. And in a sense, even if they distance it out, it's you, it still can, you know, after a long period of time, like, hey, like the Wii, um, the little uh, Wii console used to have these memos that used to pop up. Like, why don't you go outside, you know, take a break, you know, have this type of relaxation because you get so involved into something next thing you know, you would adjust to it and then when you take it off it's very very hard to accommodate back into the real world scenario or be able to process what normal vision or information that your brain needs um for everyday life yeah so looking at screens some people say you know after a long time you know staring at screen or something it does tend to give you a bit of eye strain and stuff behind the eye that's because of probably i say probably because for different people it will be different things, but maybe focusing as well. So you get it to do with reading books for hours and hours and hours on end. So if we were, you know, um, a hunter gatherer selves, you know, before we'd really started writing all the time, we wouldn't be looking at these really close distances for, you know, huge chunks of the day. Um, we'd be off and about, we'd be looking into the far distance. We'd be looking around our environment a lot more. So you'd have a lot more um, relaxation for the focal muscles as well. So to focus close up, this is just a mechanical thing. Your muscles have to like squash <laughs> the lens to make it fatter. Um, so the muscles like have to work to make it, you know, to focus on near and far distances. So it's, if you're focused, if you're crushing that, squashing that lens the whole time to focus close up, it's it, after a while, the muscles get a bit tired basically. Um, you can keep it up for a hell of a long time. As you've noticed, you know, you can play computer games for hours and hours and hours. Um, but afterwards you're, the, the muscles and things might just be a bit worn out at the end of that. So that's eye strain as well that can cause um, some people to get headaches because it's all around these, um, these nerves and things around the eyes. They're all sort of interconnected. So it's really hard to pull apart, you know, what, what exactly would be causing sort of any discomfort happening. Is there a certain propensity, I would say, for people to get migraines? Like, is there a certain class? Like, I have a cousin who can't go see 3D movies at all. Um, him and his mom both can't do it. So I start going, is it genetic? Like, you guys just can't, your brain can't handle that type of things coming at you and your brain trying to process it? Or is it like, I mean, is it linked to like, could they find something like, is it, it's IQ, maybe it's your intelligence levels. But then I know some people who are really, really smart, but they just can't. Maybe because when you say like it might be weird for vision and psychology, um, those two, I go, I mean, is it really weird? Because if you really think about like, I mean, the you're processing imagery, but at the same time, if I'm super stressed out, like I have ADHD, I can't process things very, very well. And I can get a headache very, very easy because I'm just I, more irritable, maybe. Um, so I don't know a whole lot about ADHD, <laughs> so I'll, I'll stop with what I know. Um, but in terms, you, you asked quite a few questions in there. So to go back to the migraine one you started off with. So migraine is a distinct disorder. So the things we were talking about before, about accommodation vergence, about um, you know, squashing, squashing and stretching your um, focusing muscles. Um, these are things that happen to everybody. You know, everyone's got, um, you know, you might be more or less sensitive to it, but everyone's got that sort of setup. But in terms of migraine, it is a classified um, neurological disorder. And it's actually one of the most common ones. Um, a lot, a lot of people have it. It tends to be more women um, than men. And there are lots and lots and lots of different subtypes as well. So a lot of the time when people are saying, or, oh, you know, I have a migraine there, that headache might not actually be one that will classify as a migraine attack. So people with migraines also have headaches as well as, as a separate issue. And um, that they have these sort of very distinct migraine attacks and they have to fulfill certain criteria to uh, qualify as those so um, a lot of the time when because I talk to my participants when I'm running studies they say a lot of the time that what irks them the most is the um, misunderstandings around migraine itself about what it involves and so um, there are lots of different subtypes as I said so there's ones with aura um, and they come with sort of sensory hallucinations before the onset of the headache um, so people might see something you know appearing um, where they're looking you know there's nothing there and they know there's nothing there they're just hallucinating these um these images essentially uh they they the hallucinations are really fascinating in and of themselves and this is not everyone who gets migraines so there are people who get migraines without the hallucinations as well um but when they report the visual ones they tend to be a sort of zigzag pattern it starts off quite small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it goes uh, across the cortex 
um, across the globe, but across the visual field. Um, so it sort of starts off small and starts expanding out and um, it sort of shimmers as well. So this is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then they know after that, that's going to be a headache um, starting after that one. So they, they report like seeing these really vivid hallucinations, but they can also be um, smell ones as well. So people smell things that aren't there. Yeah. Um, and also hearing things that aren't there. Um, and a very common one is um, tingling. So people have feelings of pins and needles. They feel someone described it, I think, as uh, spiders running underneath their skin or something like that. So not painful, but just a very strange sensation before is they this, get there. Is headache. this common with like vertigo and stuff like that? Like I have friends who like experience vertigo and they always talk about like massive migraines where they have to like lay down. I think I get what you're saying about people misconstruing like migraines and headaches. I always get this same thing whenever I get into an argument, the back of my head, I mean, I could pinpoint it to an exact spot. It's like right dead center in the way back starts to feel like it's on fire. And it, it's, it's happened ever since I was a little kid. It's, it's whenever I get into like a really like if I get super stressed, or if I get into a, like a big argument, and it always happens. And it actually led me down the route of uh, brain fog, because that exact like moments where I experienced like some like serious brain fog or something. It's that exact spot, like I could pinpoint it to an exact T. And I'm like, I don't know if those are migraines that I'm experiencing. I don't know what those are, but they're like chronic headaches. They're like, and it's always exactly when I start getting like really, really overwhelmed and stressed. Hmm. So I don't know. I'm not a doctor of a medical variety, me. so I'm not qualified <laughs> to diagnose anything. I will just say that up front. Um, but you, you know, if you're worried about headaches, you might want to go and see uh, your, your doctor or something to get it checked out. Um, because there are quite a lot of overlaps with a lot of other disorders as well. So a lot of people, when they say they're experiencing the hallucinations, they're afraid of the hallucinations more than the, the headache itself that follows it because they don't know what's going on. Um, but with the with the migraines, they tend to report, I say tend to, there's a lot of variation between different people. So I'm making huge sweeping generalizations here. So let that go. I, I can't really emphasize that enough that they're very idiosyncratic as well, but they often report that they're localized. So the the headache appears on maybe one side of the head. That's one of the important criteria for it as well. So, and it, they report a pulsating or a throbbing, like a pounding headache. And that's quite an important, it's, it's actually one of the classification criteria for having a migraine rather than a headache headache. Um, but stress. Uh, so, there, there is a link with stress. I don't know of too much. Um, there aren't too many sort of published studies on this because it's quite hard to, to do them. But um, the triggers for migraines, so whether or not it triggers migraines, it seems to be uh, that's a conversation in and of itself. Um, but a lot of people report stress as being associated with their, their migraines if they get them. So um, now we don't know whether it's, it's a bit of a chicken or egg, you know, are they, are they stressed due to other factors and they, is that other factor causing them to have migraines as well as being stressed, if you see what I mean, or is it the stress that causes the migraine? We can't really say that. And a lot of the time you can't really say that anyway, because the triggers tend to be firstly really idiosyncratic. So every individual has their own thing that they say, you know, it's more likely that I'm going to get a migraine when this happens. And also it tends to be, it's more likely that rather than a, if this happens, then I get a migraine. That, that sort of very definite link between if I do this, then this happens is maybe not there so much. It tends to be a much more of a probability thing, I think, from speaking to my participants. But like I say, the literature on this is pretty um, sparse. <laughs> Actually, there's not a huge amount of um, sort of really rigorous studies. They're quite tricky to do. So people get people to take a migraine diary. So they report, you know, all the things that they're doing but it's really hard to record you know your life <laughs> as an as an overall thing um because you don't necessarily know when the migraines are going to come so if you you know if you experience lots of sort of traumatic life events or something and then get migraine you might say well i'm quite stressed um that they might not actually be linked it might be something else it could be hormonal so uh, i mentioned women earlier and uh, there are certain types of migraine that seem to follow the menstrual cycle um so they tend to be a little bit more predictable so you, you can predict those ones but it's not to say that men don't get them at all so obviously there are ones that aren't um, associated with menstrual migraine a menstrual migraine is actually a thing as well in and of itself so you'll hear people refer to menstrual migraines as well as your vertigo 
um, one. So there's a, a subtype of migraine that, that people experience vertigo when they when they have their migraines. So they feel that you know things are moving without them moving, or they get that horrible experience of like you know being really high up and not not liking it very much. So it's it's multifactorial. I mean, it m- makes me think because I mean the brain is very very complex, but it's also much like kind of like a uh, sock that lost its elasticity i would say like it just keeps stretching out certain points and certain things can cause it to keep stretching and stretching and then after a certain amount of time it just really doesn't go back to its normal form that could be problems in your life that you're still experiencing that you maybe you're not coping with when i say multifactorial i mean there's stress there's uh vision issues there's so many things that could go into someone getting a headache i mean hormonal stuff's a big one but when you say hallucinations whether it's like sound hallucination whether it's vision hallucinations is is that because the migraine is not just affecting one particular spot, but it's actually spreading all over the brain where it could be affecting other parts of it too? Like, could people have problems with motor function? Yeah, there, there is a particular type of migraine where they do have problems with motor function. Um, there's a couple of them, actually. The, you also mentioned whether well, it was genetic earlier. So it does tend to run in families. And there's one type, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this because <laughs> I write it a lot more than I say it, but um, familial hemiplegic migraine. And Good on one, you. I would not be able to do that. <laughs> That, that one is genetic, um, as in they found the gene for it. Uh, I say the gene, uh, again, big overgeneralization. There seem to be three subtypes of that, but that, that affects the motor system a lot. And the familial bit means it runs in families and they've actually found the gene for it. So I think there's quite a few um, interesting therapies coming out for that particular um, subtype of migraine. They've done a lot of work with animals and things to try and work out you know, what's, what's happening in this case, because it is quite... It, I think it's fair to say that it's a very severe um, type of migraine affecting motor systems and things. So um, why not get, something that you want to have. Well, why did you choose to go down the route of studying more about migraines? Uh, that's also an interesting question. I suppose um, as a vision scientist, I just found it fascinating, really, um, because um, I'm really interested in visual processing in general. So I do other stuff as well. Um, but I just found this... Uh, I actually read a PhD thesis um, when I was writing my own and I just found it absolutely fascinating that the brain can, you know, create these um, hallucinations, can experience the world differently, essentially, Uh, because we take it for granted, don't we, you know, that our view of the world is the same as everybody else's and their experience must be just the same as ours, but we don't really know that. it's also gets a bit philosophical because you can't really test it. So as an experimental psychologist, I'm not going to go too down the philosophy um, route. But I did find it really, really fascinating that they have this hallucinations. Well, some of them do, not everyone. I must emphasize that is that it's the majority don't have these hallucinations, I must say. Um, but um, people with migraine also tend to um, perform differently on visual tasks, um, even when they're not having an attack. Um, which I found quite interesting as well. So what is different about the visual areas of their brain um, compared to other people? Is that maybe like, is it depending on the person or is it depending on the type of migraine that they're experiencing? Like, is there a classification of migraines where people experience more hallucinations or could it be a factor of maybe someone that might be a little bit more creative or, you know, more uh, of a a daydreamer, I would say, like I daydream a lot. So I I mean, I think that I'd probably get more hallucinations if I experienced one of those types of migraines. Oh, I don't know about the daydreaming. I have seen something, um, it's not really my field, so uh, you're, uh, So I don't know too much about it, but about anxiety and links between um, sort of personality traits, like how much anxiety you um, experience, so whether you're kind of uh, a more chilled, laid-back person, so whether there are sort of personality traits that go into whether or not you experience migraine, but migraine tends to be one of those things that a lot of people just experience, so I don't think it's as simple as saying like there's a cut and dry, you know, if you're an anxious type of person, you will get headaches because we just don't know that at this point. Well, how do you typically like, could you give me like maybe an example of one of your studies that you do? <laughs> so my studies might sound really weird <laughs> <I'm in>. to, uh, <laughs> to people because um, they're quite theoretically based. Um, so um, they tend to be very niche Um So like I said, I'm quite interested in how the brain processes information. And um, one of the things about uh, migraine that we're currently running actually is whether or not um, they have differences in 
uh, I'll just go through the terminology here, cortical gain control, and I'll try and explain what I mean by that. Um, so there's some parallels, and it's parallels, these are distinct disorders between photosensitive epilepsy and migraine aura. So um, photosensitive epilepsy is the type of epilepsy where um, they actually do get triggered by, you know, the flickering lights. If you've seen the warnings at, you know, flash photography and things like that, um, that's for this particular um, disorder. It is not migraine aura, but there are some similarities between them. So people with migraine aura also don't like flashing lights. It's not that it gives them any um, seizure-like activity, but they don't like it very much. So there's a couple of other sort of similarities between them. So we thought, well, you know, we wonder if it's a similar process happening. So there was a, a paper, uh, oh, I can't remember what year it was, a while ago now, I think it's 2000. I'm gonna get the dates wrong, I have my head for dates. Um, and they did a really interesting study measuring the brain of activity of people with photosensitive epilepsy while they were looking at some um, striped patterns that become more and more intense. And um, if you're, if you, they have a control group as well, so people who don't have um, photosensitive epilepsy. So for the control group, so normal um, people in inverted commas, as we might think of them, um, their brains, the response to contrast, so um, it turns from gray into very black and very white, very intense. Um, their response goes up and up and up and up and then flattens off um, because after a while you can see it clearly enough and your brain doesn't need to process this um, increasing intensity. It can sort of max out effectively, you know, like if you turn up the brightness on your display screen, after a while it's, it's too bright, isn't it? It's too contrasty. You don't, you don't need that extra. You can stop at the nice normal level. Um, but the difference is that the people with um, photosensitive epilepsy, their brain activity continued to increase and increase and increase. It didn't show this flattening off. Uh, this flattening off is the cortical gain control. And that um, is a really interesting study because if their brain is not, you know, turning the volume down, essentially, or saying, you know, that's enough and we need to stop now, that's where it might turn into this um, too much activity. And that's where you could, obviously they didn't go this far um, in an experimental design, but that's, you might extrapolate that it would turn into a seizure in that particular population. So we wondered um, if, because migraine aura has similar um, some similarities to photosensitive epilepsy, whether it would be a similar sort of process. So whether we would see this flattening off. Um, so we're currently running the study. So I don't know at the moment, we haven't got enough data to say anything at this point, but what we're looking for is whether or not in people with migraine aura, if their response to increasing contrast just goes up and up and up and up and up like those with photosensitive epilepsy or whether it flattens off um, like normal normally brained people, shall we say that, or people without migraine aura. Because you might wonder like, why on earth would you be doing that? It's to see if, because if it's a similar mechanism, there might be, it doesn't necessarily lead us directly to a treatment or anything like that, but it might tell us about what is different about their brains. And then later on, you might be able to work out something to prevent that from happening, which would be, which would be good really. So my stuff is mostly, it's not, uh, you know, drug trials or anything that goes straight into a treatment for it. It's trying to work out, you know, what are the differences? Um, so that's why it tends to be very, very abstract. <laughs> um, and it doesn't, it's not to say that, you know, after this, we'll have a drug and we'll fix migraine. And that's that. Well, it's interesting because I mean, what, what this sounds like to me is just trying to find maybe an underlying commonality between um, these people that are experiencing these things. And I just start thinking like, I mean, if we talk about like people that experience, you know, seizures from lights or something like that, I mean, where, when you look at something, you're, that light is bouncing into your eyes, and then you're perceiving, and you're kind of processing that. I mean, sometimes maybe someone can't really, you know, be able to process it correctly. I mean, it's just weird because have you looked into like if substances like alcohol or something like that affect these types of things as well too? Because I know so many people that will wear sunglasses into work when the lights are on or something like that because they had a rough night or something. And I go, I know some people that can't even look at certain lights. I have a friend that he can't do very well with like light, light, light blues. And then there's other colors of that same shade that he just can't his, it gives him headaches. It makes him, I mean, immediately his mood starts to shift. And I just start going, I mean, it leads into a whole other factors. I mean, we base a lot of colors and stuff. Color therapy, for instance, is based off, you know, moods and our reactions to things as well too, which is just like, we're just perceiving all the same thing, but some people are perceiving it 
in a little bit of a different way. Uh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we might think we see blue the same as everybody else, but we probably don't actually. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here and uh, say we probably don't. Because you were talking about, you know, if we start at the level of the eye, you've, your eye is different from somebody else's eye. It's made up of the same, you know, nuts and bolts. But in the way that, you know, our faces aren't the same, you know, we've got all the basic stuff. We've got two eyes, a nose and a mouth. Um, in your eye, you've got um, different numbers of cells compared to somebody else. You know, your blind spot would be in a different place. There are loads and loads and loads of tiny differences between it. And um, one of the things might be that people have just got different numbers of cones. Um, so cones are the cells at the back of the eye that um, detect light of various wavelengths. Um, and we've just got a different number of them each. Um, the way that our hands are different and, you know, different number of hair cells on our head or something like that, you know. So there are some differences between it. So we might well experience, you know, different colours differently. So that's the first level. Um, but the next level is that it, the information from those, they're called photoreceptors, those cells at the back of the eye, um, goes through to the brain. It goes through lots of processing before it gets to the brain as well. Um, and then you sort of experience colour as like a, I would say a colour wheel. It doesn't look like that. Um, it's a sort of funny shape that they've mapped out of what the, the brain understands colour as. Um, so it's sort of got white in the middle and then more intense colours around the edge. Um, but that will probably be sort of slightly different shapes for different people, depending on the differences between their whole visual system. So not just the cells at the back of the eye, but also the rest of the things, how much they crank up the handle for what we think of as blue, it red, et cetera. Um, so all of that will probably give us a slightly different impression of what, um, what blue and yellow and red and all the other colors are. So it's perfectly plausible, I think, that we experience them differently. Do you... Um have any different probably opinions or maybe your opinion might have changed on like the amount of technology that we use. I mean, I don't think like, I like virtual reality. I think it's cool, but also at the same time, I think that is pretty dangerous to have a screen that pressed up to your head. I mean, I know we'll get better technology for, it. I'm not against it is what I'm saying. Um, but just, I mean, we're expanding farther with technology. It's more, you know, we have more devices, more lights. You can get any type of lights, um, at different types of lamps, different types of light bulbs and stuff. And they have soft lights, they have hard lights, they have whatever you want to say. I mean, what have your thoughts changed just from diving down the route of vision and everything like that? Oh, uh, I'm pretty robust, <laughs> actually, personally, um, to all of this. So I can stare at my stripey patterns all day you know I don't really get headaches at all that's why it was all so fascinating for me that other people do you know I can stare at a computer screen for yonks as well that's it's absolutely fine um, one thing I don't get on well with is um if I don't wear my glasses so uh, but that's a very straightforward thing but I think um in terms of technology it's getting better all the time um so the temporal lag um which is a technical word for a bit of a delay so um, I've got some computer science colleagues um, who were, they ha they've experienced the, the really early types of VR, you know, before the headsets and things like that. And they said it was really like slow. So you got a, a lag in time between what you were looking at and what you thought you were looking at. Um, and they said that really didn't make people feel very well at all um, because things were happening at a different time. So that's quite important as well. And you know, in terms of lighting as well, um, flicker is quite important in the environment as well. So there are lights of certain types flicker. They flicker so fast that you don't even notice that they're flickering. Um, but there's some indication that they might give some people who are susceptible to it a, a bit of trouble as well. So it's quite important to like look into all of these things before you just, you know, branch straight out. I think virtual reality is really fun. I've used a couple of headsets, you know, the, the more, the modern ones, you know, recent years, um, where they've tidied up a lot of the things with, the lag on displays and things like that. Um, I think some people find, because I can wear them fine, um, but other people seem to put them on and say they don't like it very much or they, they feel a bit motion sick. Um, so 
that's that, what I don't like about it. I don't like because I don't know how it tricks my brain to make me think I'm actually standing on top of a skyscraper. Like I get it surrounding my whole vision. So that's my whole view. But I mean, I know I'm wearing a headset and I'm doing like we see the videos of people freaking out when they're watching it and or the, when they're playing it or something like that. But it just tricks your brain somehow, makes you think that you're exactly in this experience. And I thought you can only get that if you had your vision blocked and then also you had headphones on. I know the headphones make it more immense, like you're actually in the scenario and stuff, but you know, you're in your basement playing virtual reality. You're not on a skyscraper. And that that's what gets me is like how like our brains can be tricked by things. I mean, mirages are the best example. Like there's no water that's down the road, but when I drive up to it, the water in the puddle disappears. Where I just go, how sensitive is my brain to hallucinations? I mean, I think everybody at some point probably experiences hallucinations on like, not, I wouldn't say a daily basis, but at least a couple times more often than not in a year. Um, possibly. I don't know too much about mirages and things. They, they don't crop up that often over a year. <laughs> the UK is a bit cold for that sort of thing to be happening. Um, but yeah, uh, people do experience hallucinations for various reasons. Um, so that's why for the migraine um, diagnosis, you need a certain number of these experiences before they'll say, yeah, that's probably a migraine attack. Um, so a one-off and it vanishing um, doesn't sort of qualify you. Um, I liked what you said about the, uh, the headsets. They are very, um, very convincing, aren't they? So I think part of that, this is backed up by nothing, <laughs> but personally, I think um, part of that might be to do with that you can't see so much of the real world anymore. So when you've got the headset on, it sort of, it goes all the way around your eyes so you can't you know like when you look at a desktop display you can still see the desk and everything can't you around you but when you've got the headset on you can't see so much of like the floor and stuff and your visual system you don't just use for like looking around you also use it to keep yourself the right way up um so you know how people you ask them to balance on one leg and then shut one eye um, it becomes a lot harder all of a sudden so if you've got your eyes closed, you're using that to keep yourself upright and things. When we talk about processing information with our eyes, um, like for, for some people, like night vision, like I can't, my night vision has gone to crap. So immediately, like I'm a different person at night, not like, you know, personality wise, but just driving. Like I just, I refuse to drive at night just because I can't really see that well. I don't know when that started going away, if that was genetic or if that was just because I'm doing podcasts all the time and I'm staring at a screen and it's just my vision's definitely not as good as it was like three years ago. But <clears throat> when it comes to night vision, I mean, that's a, my whole perception. Like I know what it looks like during the day. I know this is my town. This is the road I always go to, but then at night it's like, I'm in a completely different like spot, even though it's the same exact road. I mean, is, have you, what, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, not anything I've ever considered. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, I have no idea. Um, so if you're worried about your eyesight, rule number one, though, stop driving. Um, that's that's a good thing. So if you're not comfortable driving at night, don't. But um, I don't but, know. But my freedoms, why. my freedoms, I need my freedoms. <laughs> uh, go I'm, and speak to the doctor. <laughs> See, or the optician. I mean, it goes back to the point of our eyesight and how people perceive different things. Like if we could take the example from colors, I mean, even the examples with other things such as like uh, distances for some reason, like even if I, if I see someone from a distance, they can look like somebody else. But if I had better vision then you know, someone wearing glasses goes, no, that's not that person at all. I mean, it just, I don't know how much our impact from our vision can really warp our perception of reality. I mean, one of my things I learned about recently was, you know, the temporal experience. Like we all know time moves at the same pace, but for each person, it could be a different, our perception of time can be different. Some people say like, you know, I had so much fun. Time really just flew by. Well, for another person in the world, the time probably went slow or normal compared on what they were doing. And it just made me go like, our brains can really warp our reality around us to a point where it's, we all agree this is reality. Like we're all in the same kind of reality, but at the same time, we all have our inner monologues or our own little realities going on as well too. Well, that's a big one. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess I don't really know about that one <laughs> um, at all. Um, so you're talking a lot about the, the eyes, processing things i'm worried about um, my vision yeah very very much um well the eyes are sort of like 
I like a computer analogy because I spend a lot of time with computers one way or the other. Um, but the eyes are a bit like the mouse and keyboard of a computer. Like if there's a problem with it, um, this is where the input's coming from. If there's a problem with your eyes, you won't see properly. That's going to be an issue there. But all the sort of processing power and everything that's done with the inputs happens in the tower of the computer or the, the laptop base where the motherboard is essentially, doesn't it? So that's a good way of thinking about how the, the brain and the visual system works. So the eyes are absolutely essential. If you need glasses, you need glasses. <laughs> you should get them. Um, the same way that if your computer mouse was broken, you know, you would get that fixed before uh, looking at the rest of the computer. So um, if you're worried about your eyes, I would definitely sort of check those out. I know you mentioned something before about with migraines. You said it wasn't necessarily about working to get a medication or anything done. But what is your overall goal when it comes to just being able to, you know, study migraines a little bit more? Are you trying to hope that maybe you could classify it in some way? Oh, I've never really thought about the overall goal. I suppose I should spend more time career planning, maybe. <laughs> um, but like I said, I'm sort of a basic um, sort of scientist, um, if that makes sense. So my main goal is to sort of understand how things work. I've always just found that really interesting. You know, how does this work? How does that work? How does the other thing work? And I think well, the brain is one of the most complicated systems in the universe, probably, from my perspective, because I'm biased. Um, so to understand a little bit about how the brain works is just something I'd, I'd like to do. It's pretty much intrinsic motivation. Um, there's so much of the brain and it can do so much stuff that we'll never like go, aha, I know how the brain works now. Um, but if you can understand a tiny little bit of it, then that's, I think, fascinating in itself. And from the disorders, um, so most people would say, uh, migraine is a neurological disorder um, it tells you a bit about how it works differently in different people and that can give you insights into how it might work in general as well so for this group of people if we work out you know why they're seeing things differently we can understand how um, people see the world in general as well as just those people so it's not all about um, therapies for them that being said I would love to um, be involved in something to help find a therapy especially for um for people who can't take medication so there's a lot of medication out there and the medication is getting better and better um, there's a lot of research done into it a lot of really good stuff and there's been some really um interesting stuff coming out right now i don't know if it's all been through clinical trials and things like that but there seem to be really promising medications that are working for more and more people but for a lot of people they they don't the ones that are currently used um, don't work or we don't know how they work um, and there's people say I mentioned about women you know so if you're pregnant or something you might not want to take lots of heavy medications but equally you don't want to be in, <laughs> in pain a lot of the time so being able to stop people's pain and have a sort of non-drug related therapy would be really fantastic as well but that's not something that you do on your own you do that in part of a big team so um, I'd really like to do um, maybe some of the basic science to look into non-drug um, therapies for migraine and um, even if that gets sort of if you can do the basics and find out a, a possible something that has possibilities then other people might pick that up and you know because it takes a lot to get from this might work to you know this is an actual treatment for it. Have you thought about any possibilities like with something like cold shock or something to do with water? Or I know a lot of people say water is healing, you know, whenever I have a friend that's going through like a vertigo thing. Um, I don't know the full depth of vertigo, so I couldn't even give a good explanation about what that is. But, you know, they always talk about like showers help and certain situations, but I have to lay down. But, you know, like it's from what I've understood, it's like they get dizzy really, really bad. And they kind of go like, you have to put like a foot on the floor and a foot on the wall. I'm like, that's what I do. And like, if I'm drunk or something, I do that like to make sure that I'm not, the room stops spinning, but it, that helps them. And I start going like, I mean, it, is there a cold shock possibility? Is there some type of method? Cause I'm, I'm with you on the medication stuff when it comes to like there, you need medications for certain things, but also like for some people, that's not really an option for some people, you know, if they're pregnant or something, they want to try another form of therapy. I mean, I know people try smells, smells can kind of bring you back to a sense as well too. So yeah, there's a couple of things I'd like to, um, investigate there's some idea that colors might be helpful um this is <laughs> yeah you're going back to colors i can see your face so you're not looking um so 
Um, how do I start with this one? Well, there's been some coloured filters that exist. Um, they've a lot of the time been used for sort of visual stress, mostly for reading. Um, but there's been some interesting data on a, um, an fMRI study. So that's, um, if you don't know what fMRI is, that's, it measures the brain's response to stuff um, by measuring the amount of um, oxygenated and deoxygenated um, hemoglobin in the blood. Um, but yeah, you can measure brain activity using a big scanner. Science. <laughs> it's, a, it's a better way of, better way of putting <laughs> it. Um, so uh, they got some people with uh, migraines and they measured their brain activity with and without these sort of colored glasses on. Um, the color is really, really, really important. It has to be a very specific color and it's not just one color fits all. It's a specific color for a specific person, but that seemed to reduce their um, brain activity. So if there is any mileage in that, we need to firstly work out how it works, uh, which is not an easy thing to solve. Um, wait, wait, is that, is that kind of like when a room is kind of dark, it kind of has everybody, like their energy levels can kind of drop sometimes. Like, you know, if you're going to watch a movie, you don't usually watch a movie with, you know, your lights all the way on. You usually watch them with like, maybe you could have a candle lit depending on the situation. I don't know what's going on, but usually people watch movies in the dark and usually by that time they end up falling asleep while their TV's on or something like that. I mean, is it just if you use like dull or not one say dull colors, but like when I wear sunglasses outside, if my sunglasses are polarized, it helps with my vision just so the sun's not blinding me. But at the same time, I also feel my energy levels kind of dip down a little bit. Maybe I'm too sensitive. Uh, I don't know about energy levels. Um, the polarizing glasses do help take out glare because um, it just makes sure that all the lights at the same angle uh, rather than like scattered about. Um, but the, the thing with the fMRI study was they had um, like a, a control lens as well. So that's a, a different color. So it's not just that it made it darker, if you sort of mean by filtering some of the light out because you didn't see the same effect with the control color. It, so the specific one that they chose seemed to help like reduce the brain's activity. And one of the ideas with migraine is that there's sort of too much activity in the brain. So if you can sort of reduce it a bit, that might be really helpful. So that would be something that, I don't know, there's a lot of controversy around it and I'm not going to go into that, but if it did help at least, I don't think it would work for everyone. I think it would be a very specific subset if it did and we need to sort of make sure we knew why and who it's working for if it does so there's a lot that needs to be done there but if that were the case then it would be great to be able to you know try some colored glasses because there's very little in the way of side effects because they're just colored glasses um so you know even if they didn't work at all but the other thing is maybe neurostimulation so there's been much more research on um neurostimulation which sounds terrifying uh, to a lot of people um but you can uh you can put a very, very, very small amount of um, electricity into the brain. I mean, really, really, really small. So like- To where it feels like a vibration. Yeah, you don't actually feel it that much, actually. Um, you might feel some slight tingling as it starts and then that's it. Um, but there's some studies looking at these sort of neurostimulation um, devices and they might have something um, that's of interest there so again there needs to be a lot more research on it and a lot more systematically because uh, the thing with neurostimulation is you know how long do you stimulate for which area of the brain do you stimulate um, how many sessions do you need it wouldn't be a silver bullet of like we do this once and you never have migraines again it would be more like um, a regular thing I think so they've tried um, something called transcranial magnetic stimulation um, for acute migraine. So that's like the attack is starting and you want it to not happen. Um, and they've, there's some studies that seem to suggest that might help. And then for the sort of preventing migraine happening, um, the, there's some, not much, um, literature on some promising things from sort of electrical stimulation. So you would pop, these sound terrifying, but electrodes, um, on your head, uh, they're soaked in saline, so salty water. Um, and you just apply a really tiny current. So I'm talking really, really, really tiny. Um, and that seems to help some people, but I think there's not very many, um, what's called a randomized control trial about these. 
Um, so randomized control trials are like what you have when, um, I guess maybe everyone knows what a randomized control trial is after COVID and vaccines and all the rest of it, but there's, there's not many of those at the moment. And there's not a lot of idea about how that would work as well, because that's the important thing you want to know how it's supposed to work in order to be able to say how long a person needs to use it for, how many sessions, what area of the brain they should stimulate. All of these things we just don't know. So you can't really launch in and say, right, we're going to do this complete, you know, randomized control trial at huge expense when we don't know, you know, what bit of the brain to, to stimulate. There are some ideas out there, but I think it needs a bit more work on sort of how it's supposed to work first. And then we might be able to go somewhere with that. But it would be amazing if you could have different options for different people. It's not to say that the drugs aren't brilliant. So for some people, they're making a huge difference, you know, um, and they really are coming on and on and on. And there's a lot of good work done into that. But, you know, if for whatever reason they're not working for you or you couldn't take them, then looking into some different things might be of interest because equally neurostimulation, it does have side effects. So it's not like the the silver bullet you know the wonder solution for everything it would just be different ones compared to the drugs so I think it's worth investigating that as well you know because it would get around a few problems for other people if you see what I mean because I think one of the things with migraine is it's so um it's so different you know there are so many different subtypes and so many individuals within each subtype that it's all quite idiosyncratic um it'd be worth having a few you know quite a few different things that might help different people depending on the subtype they have or how often they have them or what their personal preference would be as well because not everyone would be comfortable with you know nearest stimulation and things like that i got two very important questions one i want to go back to something you mentioned about a migraine diary what are they writing down in a migraine diary so generally um the attack the details about it so if they saw any hallucinations um the severity of it, um, what day and time, how long it lasted for, all of those sorts of things, and then any other information that would be included. Because it's really hard when you come into a clinic and you're sitting in front of a neurologist and they say, well, how many migraine attacks do you have a month? Uh, it can be quite hard to say, oh, this month I had three, I don't know. You know, it's really hard to piece it together after the event. Whereas if you've got your diary with it all written down, you can just look through that and go, aha, right in September I had so many, they were really bad. October, maybe fewer, because it it varies as well. So things tend to go up and down a bit as well. So for some months they might be having a particular bad spate and then it might ease off a bit and then come back again for another bad spate. And for some people they go, they just stop. So the way that migraines for some people just start, they also fortunately just stop happening or you know they used to have really regular ones but now they haven't had one for a year or something like that so they it's not to say that you'll be stuck with it forever necessarily as well what's the rate of time or maybe the time variability when it comes to these attacks like are they lasting days are they lasting are they usually end the same day um so according to the classification criteria if it's untreated so you don't do anything about it the headache attack could last four to 72 hours so Jeez. could be four hours could be 72 yeah so um i think what people don't realize as well um uh, because when people are talking about you know they have fairly frequent migraine attacks you know maybe three a month some people have 10 a month um if you're talking about you know having a headache for 72 hours several times a month it's quite difficult to go to your boss and say you know I'm really struggling to work because I'm having a headache um so that is something that they struggle with as well you know in terms of jobs in terms of school if they're still at school with you know younger people having migraine attacks so it can be really a real problem for their life you know because a lot of people think oh migraine take a couple of paracetamol go to sleep you'll be fine um but actually they say well it can be really debilitating because they're having to take um time off you know essentially and then their boss starts you know saying you take a lot of time off for headaches you know maybe they're a bit skeptical um one of my participants <clears throat> said to me which is really quite sad i think um that their partner didn't really get it you know their life partner that they live with and she said that you know <laughs> it's like they live together and even they didn't really understand it. Not to say that they weren't supportive, but they just didn't get it. Um, 
So, well, I, I think that's probably a fault. I mean, what you're doing here as well, too, is educating me more on what migraines are, because I think when we talked about in the beginning, which was the misdiagnosis of migraines, a lot of people just say, I have a migraine right now. And it might just be to push something off to the side or not wanting to do something, which in a term, I mean, for people who actually experience migraines, that's kind of like an insult to them because people who experience migraines, for instance, I, if you ask me the question, how many people do I think experience migraines? I'd say everybody experiences migraines. And it's not necessarily true. They might just be experiencing a headache. And if you don't know what that type of feeling is when someone is having a migraine and they tell you, I need this day off because I have a migraine, then it's hard for you to be able to relate to what those are. So I think also with better education of us understanding migraines a little bit more like you're kind of teaching me a little bit right now, helps me understand the situation that some people are placed in. It's not the same thing as just getting a headache. It's something completely different. Uh, yeah, <laughs> essentially, yeah. From speaking to my participants, that's one of the things that I really didn't realize when I started out in this. Um, that you know they are quite misunderstood, um, and I think that's you know if nothing else comes of everything that I'm doing, just making a few more people aware about you know that migraines are different from headaches. So it's not to say that normal people who don't have migraines can't have bad headaches and need time off work for a bad headache. You might have it for a variety of reasons. Um, but to help people understand a bit more maybe what migraines are um, would be really helpful. That's what quite a few of my participants have said to me, you know, just in passing. Because, you know, obviously we chat about it when they come to the lab and I'm covering them with gel for an EEG and stuff like that. So, you know, to, to record brain activity, you put, um, you put someone uh, like a swimming cap on someone's head and you have uh, loads of electrodes and you just it it sounds scary but it's just messy really because to get a good connection you, you put a bit of hair gel in it's not drill cream it's um uh conductive hair gel so that you can record the tiny um electrical activity from the brain because it's really really small and um, so while you're doing all of this you know you just in general have a chat a lot of the time um and that's when people tend to tell me you know a lot more about their migraines and things like that about what it what it is for them and they said you know it's the experience of a migraine attack that people don't necessarily get, um, which I thought was really enlightening, actually, from talking to them. Do you find that maybe or maybe this is an idea or might just be kind of idiotic, but do you find that if closing off maybe one of your senses, in a sense, not permanently, but just temporarily can actually help with the migraine, just may, maybe making it go away? Because, I mean, is it, we talk about processing too much information. I mean, if someone just closes their eyes or maybe kind of shuts out noise, much like if we're, I mean, it's probably not the same, but much like if we're driving, we turn down the radio when we start getting closer to an area to find a location or something. I'm like, you're just reducing noise in a sense so i go i mean you can do that in a lot of things people can do that with stress on other factors as well too i just go with a migraine if someone's experiencing something from my friends that have actual like vertigo and get migraines from that they talk about how they kind of need to no cell phone nothing they can't do anything they just need to lay down and i go well you're you're closing off your signal in a sense you're just trying to reduce all the noise down to one specific area and it helps you deal with it faster um anecdotally speaking um that's what they tend to do I think um so they feel a migraine attack coming on and um uh, because they they really find themselves a lot of the time like really quite hypersensitive to um light and to sound so they really really don't like it they will just go and lie down in the darkened room and if they can go to sleep and that seems to help um for quite a few people so it'd be pretty similar to what you're talking about you know to just switch everything off and and go to sleep and in the classification criteria yeah I think it says that you know unless you do anything about your headache one of the things a lot of people do about it is you know they just go to sleep and then that seems to help them when it comes to the emotional side of this just from the participants that you talk to and you kind of experience have you gotten a new kind of understanding of the emotional damage that kind of goes around with this type of thing like i mean for me like if i experienced a, a really bad headache it it sucks because i can't usually do what i want to do that day but also at the same time imagine experiencing that like every couple of months or you know multiple times um in a month or something like that i mean there has to be a, an emotional toll as well too not just a physical one um yeah i would have thought so yeah from talking to them it's it's quite a lot to it's it's a long-term neurological disorder isn't it you know so I think yeah essentially um I can't really speak for them um 
to be i can imagine this would be really difficult i because I, I feel like that would be if i was going to study something like this that would be something i'd be focused on just because the emotional side of things i mean it's it's psychology but experimental psychology and that's what makes it kind of more interesting because the experimental psychology i know you're explaining about experiments that they might sound weird they're fascinating this like the, the type of studies you guys do i mean not just you but other people out there too people that study time or something like that right just start going it sounds kind of like it does kind of sound weird, but it's just interesting to see what else is going on out there because there's things that we are still trying to find answers for. I mean, if we talk about the human brain, it is a lot like space in a sense because it is so vast. There's so much about it that we're learning. Um, it's just fascinating thing that's inside of us and just what people experience, what people experience physically, emotionally, what people think about, what people process, everything is completely different. It's multifactorial, which makes it very, very fascinating when someone's able to come up with like a medication or come up with a cure for something like that. Cause I'm like, to me, it's like a hit or a miss. I mean, it could work for one person and not work for another person. But the fact that we've got it down to such a point where we're able to create actual like Tylenol, if you got a headache or other things of this sort, I mean, that to me is pretty fascinating. Yeah, I think so. Um, so for me, I think the biggest problem is time <laughs> and expertise. So you find that the more you find out about the brain, the more you realize you don't know anything about it at all, uh, which is um, just how it is, I think. Um, but it's certainly enough to keep you busy for several lifetimes. Um, but I've never looked into emotion myself because that's not my area of expertise it's not to say that I don't think it's interesting um but there's a bit of a trade-off between what you can get done and what your expertise is in and where things lead you as well actually and um, so I've just been looking at the sort of the nuts and bolts about how how it might all happen um, but yeah that's not to say that there isn't an emotional toll and that these aren't interesting questions I think they are um especially for there's other types as well of migraines um gastric migraines as well so like um, with a lot of people with yeah a lot of people with migraines there's a big link to nausea and vomiting and that goes for all types of migraine so there seems to be some sort of really interesting gut connection and um i think now i'm going well out of my area of expertise now i think that's um something that can happen for other um other emotional things as well so um i think that link wants to be looked into a bit more and there will be people out there doing research onto this it's just that i don't know anything about the gut and how the gut and the brain are linked but they are um quite a lot i think and there's more and more stuff being done on that but that's just not something i know anything about there's only so much you can read in your life um to be honest so <laughs> you've got to draw the line in the sand somewhere if you could choose another path um like if you could have chose something else besides this where would you have gone oh gosh wow i've never really thought about that I'm pretty happy with my life as it is. <laughs> I never expected to be a vision scientist. I don't think any child as a five-year-old wakes up and says, mummy, today, when I grow up, I'm going to be a psychologist. I mean, it was a bit of a surprise going to university in the first place, to be honest. I just did better at my um, A-levels than I thought I was going to. <laughs> um, and then I went and I found it really interesting and I really enjoyed psychology in particular. Um, and I just carried on from here. But it was all purely by chance um, because there were some really great researchers doing some work where I studied for my undergraduate degree and I did a, a summer internship with them and that's how I got into this actually um, so it's just one of those absolute luck <laughs> situations but yeah well that's awesome well I appreciate you for giving me your time and uh, explaining a little bit about your work as well too is there a place where people can find any of your links do you have a website a twitter uh, I don't tweet, um, but I, <laughs> good for you. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I'm a bit of a dinosaur. Um, but yeah, the, um, Nottingham Trent university has, um, that's got my, my website with my mugshot and my publication. So all of my research is, is up there. So that's probably where you can find most stuff in a short bio that says I studied I failed to leave the university. <laughs> well, I'll make I sure. just switched to different universities. <laughs> I'll make sure I link it all in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting and thanks for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast.